devices. And please note that today's meeting will be on the record and streamed live on CFR.org and the Council's YouTube page. Thank you so much, and we'll begin shortly. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, because of time and an important statement by the Vice Chairman, I'm going to be very quick, abrupt, no discussion of his immense accomplishments. I'm going to assume so many of you know that. Uh, I need to welcome you to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. Um, it is part of the C. Peter McCullough series on international economics. I don't know, Vice Chairman, if you can talk about international economics here today. We'll get to that. Um, I'd also like, of course, to welcome all CFR members around the nation and the world participating in this meeting uh, through uh, the live stream. And, of course, I should stay here, as I will a number of times. This is an on-the-record uh, meeting today. Without further ado, the Vice Chairman with a statement. Well, thanks uh, very much, Tom, and thanks very much to the Council on uh, Foreign Relations for inviting me uh, to take part. I wasn't quite sure when I was, I wasn't sure when I was invited that it was going to be this day uh, relative to what's going on outside, but uh, here we are. And uh, to get things started, I thought I'd uh, provide some background on recent monetary policy decisions. I should mention uh, before continuing that my comments today reflect my own views and are not an official position of the Board of Governors or the federal somewhere between zero and a quarter percent. This, uh, uh, this ultra-low rate was in keeping with our congressional mandate, which is to pursue a monetary policy that fosters maximum employment and price stability, which we define as 2% inflation. Our decision in December was based on the substantial improvement in the labor market and the committee's confidence that inflation would return to our 2% goal over the medium term. Employment growth last year averaged a solid 220,000 per month. The unemployment rate declined from 5.6% to 5% over the course of 2015. Inflation ran well below our target last year, held down by the transitory effects of declines in crude oil prices and also in the prices of non-oil imports. Prices for these goods have fallen further and for longer than expected. Once these oil and import prices stop falling and level out, their effects on inflation will dissipate 
which is why we expect that inflation will rise to 2% over the medium term, supported by a further strengthening in labor market conditions. I would note that our monetary policy remains accommodative after the small increase in the federal funds rate adopted in December. And my colleagues and I anticipate that economic conditions will evolve in a manner that will warrant only gradual increases in the federal funds rate and that the federal funds rate is likely to remain for some time below the levels that we expect to prevail in the longer run. Given the large size of the Fed's balance sheet, the FOMC is employing new tools to implement monetary policy. In particular, to raise the federal funds rate, we increase the interest rate we pay on reserve balances that depository institutions hold at the Federal Reserve. We also employed an overnight reverse repo facility, reverse repurchase facility, through which we interact with a broad range of firms to help provide a soft floor for the federal funds rate consistent with our target range. These new tools have worked well, and the federal funds rate and other short-term interest rates have increased as expected to the range between a quarter percent and half a percent. We'll continue to monitor financial market developments closely, and we can make adjustments to our tools if needed to maintain control over money market rates. At our meeting last week, we left our target for the federal funds rate unchanged. Economic data over the intermeeting period suggested that improvement in labor market conditions continued even as economic growth slowed late last year. But further declines in oil prices and increases in the value of the dollar, foreign exchange value of the dollar, suggested that inflation would likely remain low for somewhat longer than had previously been expected before moving back to 2%. In addition, increased concern about the global outlook, particularly the ongoing structural adjustments in China, and the effects of the declines in the prices of oil and other commodities on commodity exporting nations appeared early this year to have triggered volatility in global asset markets. At this point, it is difficult to judge the likely implications of this volatility. If these developments lead to a persistent tightening of financial conditions, they could sig signal a slowing in the global economy that could affect growth and inflation in the United States. But we've seen similar periods of volatility in recent years that have left little permanent imprint on the economy. As the FOMC said in its statement last week, we are closely monitoring global economic and financial developments and assessing their implications for the labor market and inflation and for the balance of risks to the outlook. Now, I expect that in a few minutes, one of you will ask not about what we did at our last meeting, but rather what we're going to do at the, next, <laughs> at the next meeting. I can't answer that question because, as I've emphasized in the past, we simply do not know. The world is an uncertain place, and all monetary policymakers can really be sure of is that what will happen is often different from what we currently expect. That is why the committee has repeatedly indicated that its policy decisions will be data dependent. That is, we will adjust policy appropriately in light of economic and financial events to best foster conditions consistent with the attainment of our employment and inflation objectives. As you know, in making our policy decisions, my FOMC colleagues and I spend considerable time assessing the incoming economic and financial in information and its implications for the economic outlook. But we also must consider some other issues, two of which I will mention briefly today. First, should we be concerned about the possibility of the unemployment rate falling somewhat below its longer-run normal level, as the most recent FOMC projections suggest? In my view, a modest overshoot of this sort would be appropriate in current circumstances for two reasons. First, other measures of labor market uh, conditions, such as the fraction of workers with part-time employment who would prefer to work full-time, 
and the number of people out of the labor force who would like to work indicate that more slack may remain in the labor market than the unemployment rate alone would suggest. And second, with inflation currently well below 2%, a modest overshoot actually could be helpful in moving inflation back to 2% more rapidly. Nonetheless, a persistent large overshoot of our employment mandate would risk an undesirable rise in inflation that might require a relatively abrupt tight policy tightening, which could in inadvertently push the economy into recession. Monetary policy should aim to avoid such risks, turn to 2% over time. Persistent deviations from our goal in either direction could cause economic harm and could ultimately unmoor longer-term inflation The Federal Reserve will, in the longer run, hold no more securities than necessary to implement monetary policy efficiently and effectively. But that statement leaves open the question of when we should begin to reduce the size of our balance sheet. Because the tools I mentioned earlier, the payment of interest on reserve balances and the overnight repurchase facility can be, uh, can be used to raise the federal shock to the economy. Consistent with this view, the committee has decided to continue to reinvest principal payments from our securities portfolio until normalization of the federal funds rate is well underway. The decision about when to cease or begin phasing out reinvestment will depend on how economic and financial conditions and the economic outlook evolve. Well, thank you. I'd be happy to respond to some. And on behalf of all my colleagues, uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here. I, I, I could think of eight ways you could have canceled this meeting today with grace and dignity. There's so much going you, on. You should have told me that before. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's just so much uh, going on, and we'll try to get to it all with respect for uh, your public service. Ultra accommodative, as you mentioned, we're now accommodative. We're migrating in some direction. Michael Faroli here with J.P. Morgan and this idea of a terminal value, a place we're heading to, the vector of uh, where we want to go is maybe to a new lower level. Uh, of members of the FOMC are somewhere around three and a quarter, three, three and a half percent, which is on average a bit lower than in, in the past. Um, but we'll be data dependent and we'll see, uh, see what happens. We don't have to uh, fix a rate that we'll be at. We can indicate what members of the uh, FOMC believe, which is what the number I've just given you is. Within the debate that you have at the Federal Open Market Committee, there's such a separation now between our service sector and our goods producing sector. What have you learned about our manufacturing economy in the recent quarters as many are concerned of a recession in manufacturing? Well, the, uh, manufacturing growth has, uh, has declined and uh, We'll have to, uh, again, wait and see what develops. But uh, we're in a process, the American economy is in a very long-run process of manufacturing declining as a share of GDP and services continuing to increase as a share of GDP. And uh, so there's been a tendency for manufacturing to grow less rapidly than GDP for some time. We are data dependent. I, I'm not quite sure. Was that phrase in Dornbush Fisher stars? <laughs> no? Not as far as I remember, but. The data dependent or there's actual progress. What does actual progress mean to you when you attach Fisher academics over to Fisher policymaking and the advice you give Chair Yellen? What does actual progress actually mean? Well, actual progress is that we are uh, progressing towards meeting our goals, and our goals are defined. Uh, by law and by uh, the statement uh, on our long-run goals that I mentioned earlier. And uh, our view of progress is uh, what the law calls maximum employment and what we call maximum sustainable employment uh, and a 2% inflation rate. And when we get there, we are there, we're very close to there on employment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and on inflation, the uh, core number that came out this morning was 1.4%. Um, you know, that's not 2%. It's not in another universe. It's not a negative number. But uh, 
inflation's been pretty stable and we'd like it to go up. My colleague Michael McKee points out the idea, and of course the classic phrase is inflation uh, no longer always everywhere, uh, and, uh, ev always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I mean, there's an academics here and then there's lessons learned in the recent. And uh, that's what we're dealing with. That's a large, uh, a significant part of what we're dealing with at the present time. And uh, the uh, price of oil, somewhere below 30, was, at least was recently, can continue, could continue to decline. I'm talking as an academic now. I'm not making a prediction. You can make uh, a prediction if you'd like. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, the, the price of oil will stop declining at some point. We don't have to have it rot. Huh? Uh, my job's in jeopardy on radio. <laughs> Well, I, I'm forever quoting Herbert Stein, who uh, I had the privilege of working with early in my career, and one of Herb's many uh, wise one-liners was, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. <laughs> and uh, as long as we're talking about the dollar price of oil, it can't go on forever falling. So uh, it will stop. It will clear markets. Do we, at some point, oil will clear and we will move forward. Do you just assume inflation will revert, as you said, to a longer run trend or are there permanent effects to this great recession? The connection is, is remarkably close in a direction which you wouldn't actually have thought of originally. That is, uh, when the price of oil goes up, equity prices have been going up lately, not down. Uh, and um, somebody said to me uh, recently, well, that's because the market treats the price of oil as entirely a demand phenomenon, and it's an index of what's happening. It's largely a supply phenomenon, and uh, so precisely how the markets will digest this and when they'll begin to interpret it differently uh, we'll have to uh, watch and see. You mentioned in your comments today uncertainty. That takes me back to Skidelsky's writings on Keynes, the idea of folding in uncertainty, or as Larry Summers would say, the importance of confidence into our monetary policy making. Fold in for us right now where we are with our uncertainty and where we are with a lack of confidence. Well, it's comparatively recent. The uncertainty we're dealing with now started basically at the turn of uh, this year, the enhanced, the higher level mm -hmm. of uncertainty. And uh, we, since we raised the interest rate uh, in the middle of December, uh, we've had a very high uh, labor, labor f uh, increase in employment in the data reported at the beginning of uh, January. So when you look at the real side of the American economy, and I'm putting the survey of economic projections of the uh, uh, 17 members of the uh, Open Market Committee, every three months we all fill out a survey which asks a lot of questions about growth, about uh, announcements, is we believe it will be gradual, et cetera, et cetera. It's not, well, we're going to do it four times. We don't have to do that term and uh, mm -hmm. decisions. So that is the process that uh, takes place. And then we present the uh, summary of those projections. But there were, there were I can, I'm not allowed to talk about what pe individuals thought. Do I have you in a lot of trouble right now? <laughs> oh, I think you started from the beginning, Tom. Uh, the... Uh, the uh, you know, there, there, there were people then who thought it would be a slow process. You see them mm -hmm. quoted in the press. Everybody on the committee is allowed to say what he or she says or thinks. He's not allowed to say what other people say or think. Mm -hmm. But you see, we've had enough people saying what they think for you to realize that there were some who yeah. were less, uh, who, who thought there'd be fewer and some who thought there'd be uh, Quite a few. Productivity is a mystery. If you go back to your work years ago and uh, the, the seminal work of Solo and Mondigliani and others, productivity in this strange new thing, and this is only a recent idea in my head, 
do we really have a gauge on technological progress now? Are, are you, Chair Yellen and others, are you flying blind to an extent because you can't gauge or measure America's technological progress or mismeasure it almost? Well, e economists have a measure. It's that part of growth they can't account for by increases in, uh, increases in capital input and labor input. And uh, you use some production function and you come up with a number. Um, that number has declined significantly. There are books written about it. Bob Gordon's recent book has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and Bob says the great inventions were all inventions of the 1940s. Modern inventions about which we're very impressed, uh, internet and all that, will not have anything like the impact on productivity that- Do you agree? I'm, I, this, this is one where you cannot have a well-based uh, mm. well uh, judgment. And I think this is a case of whether you think of yourself as an optimist or are an optimist or a pessimist. I'm an optimist. And uh, I believe that the things we're looking at now will lead to enormous changes in the organization of economic activity in the United States and in the productivity of uh, American workers. Mm -hmm. November 19th last year, Stanley Fisher, the basic question of whether the economic center of gravity of the world will continue its shift of recent decades toward Asia in particular to China or perhaps to China and India, this shift would represent a return in some key respects to the global order of two centuries ago, I guess that's the long term, of two centuries ago and earlier before the economic rise of the West. Mm -hmm. We have a most interesting international economics now. We could speak of the oil economy, we could speak of Europe, but we had the news of course, I, I believe it was on Friday, of negative interest rates with the Bank of Japan. I know it's inappropriate to ask you about other banks and their action now, but to those of us in the room who know that negative rates isn't in a Fisher textbook, it is new territory. Comment on the experiment of negative interest rates as one part of Five Nations Monetary Toolbox. And this is an idea which was discussed in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, there are a variety of suggestions around about how to deal with the fact that because currency exists and has a zero interest rate in nominal terms, if you hold dollars in your pocket, you're not getting interest on that, uh, it was assumed that you couldn't go below zero. And then there was a whole discussion about how to do it. If you wanted to go below zero, and there's a famous uh, I don't know if he's European or Argentine economist Giselle, who said you should stamp the paper. Once a year, you have to bring it in to have it maintain its value, and its value goes down according to the stamp that's on it, uh, so that you can get a negative rate of return on currency. If that was there, then you could get negative rates of return in the whole economy. That was already a 1930s uh, idea, and I've even seen uh, pictures of some stamped currency. Mm -hmm. Whether they're genuine, I don't know. Um, so that idea has been around. And the, the problem is you, uh, that we believed that we could not get interest rates to go below zero. Well, it turns out that five European countries, uh, and uh, sorry, four, four European and one, one uh, Asian country have now done that. And how can you do that when currency has a zero rate of return? You can do it because it turns out that holding currency is not so easy. If you're going to keep your billion dollars in currency, you're going to have to find a place to store it. You're going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to insure it. And you're going to have to have it guarded. And by the time that's done, you've no longer, zero is no longer the lower bound. All those costs are the lower bound, and those costs seem to be significantly below zero mm -hmm. in, the K, in the sense that we have a uh, Denmark and uh, one other country having a, zero, a, 75, a negative 75 basis point interest rate, which, uh, which worked. 
Now, there's a lot of details that I don't want to go into about it. It didn't work across the whole economy. Uh, they didn't include the small depositors in that crowd who were, not, who were getting negative interest rates. Uh, so that idea is there, and that's what they're pursuing. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody is looking at, at how, that, uh, how that works. But, uh, you know, practical policy, you've got to uh, do a heck of a lot of work. I spoke with Barry Eichengreen recently of Berkeley, and we compared dollar strength to what we saw in the late 90s, the so-called Rubin dollar. And he said, and this is exact words, he sees elements of Plaza Accord dynamics, where we had a huge dollar move as well. The instabilities, the, 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 the set of instabilities that we have in January of 2016, are they instabilities that can lead to significant flows out of nations, whether it's from negative interest rates or from other actions? Do you worry about flows of capital becoming more abrupt? Well, that, that's uh, clearly a concern. It's always a concern when, uh, when markets are very volatile. Um, but it, you know, it's part of the business, and uh, we, we watch that, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. You mentioned in your comments this morning three times, I thought of your esteemed colleague, Mr. Dornbush, a modest overshoot. The overshoots are dangerous, are they? That's what gets you, you types into trouble, isn't it? <laughs> Those overshoots. I came close to saying that in what I said a few minutes ago. Uh, you don't want to go too far. Uh, because you go too far, you have to come back fairly quickly, and those, mm -hmm. then it has a tendency, a possibility of becoming unstable. So uh, you know, small overshoots, not a big problem. Big overshoots, yes. Are we in a time of big overshoots? I mean, if, if we move forward no. here with the shock that we saw on uh, Friday, the abrupt weakening of the Japanese yen, are we... Are we near that kind of instability, or do you have a great confidence, as Willem Bowder does at Citigroup, that there's a, a confidence in what we do with monetary policy? Well, there is, of course, a confidence in what we do in monetary policy, and that's why we have to consider what we do and also not give rapid answers to new questions. We're still thinking. <laughs> and on that We're note, we will move to our that. audience. <laughs> um, there's just so many people to uh, turn to uh, today. Uh, Dr. Ferroli, I see you back there hiding. Would you like to go with our first question? I don't want to get you in trouble with James Diamond, but I'd be honored, Michael Ferroli, who has led so much of the debate on terminal value. Would you have a question for the vice chairman? Uh, I, I guess I wonder if uh, we've learned more about the cost of negative interest rates. Let's get a microphone on Michael Ferroli. He's being so, do we have a Just what we've learned about the cost of negative interest rates relative to the last time the FOMC discussed this, and I think it was 2012. Uh, well, we, we clearly have, uh, imper imper we have actual experience of countries that have used negative interest rates, and I haven't done a careful evaluation. Countries that have used it continue to use it. They haven't uh, given it up. We even had the Danes uh, undertaking a contractionary monetary policy. They raised the interest rate from minus 75 basis points to minus 65 basis points, thereby raising the interest rate. Um, so it's working more than I can say that I expected uh, in 2012, though I wasn't on the committee at that stage. Mr. Peterson, please. Thank you for that excellent presentation. I know, Stanley, that as is usually the case, you said very little about the long-term debt outlet, the interest costs that go with it, and the feeling of some of us that it's not only unprecedented, but it's unsustainable, and it's very largely unaddressed. Tell me how concerned you are about the truly long-term debt interest cost situation and what you think if, should be done about it, if anything. 
The um, most recent uh, CBO projections suggest that uh, in about six or seven years, interest costs will begin to rise in the uh, in the budget, and uh, you can try everything, but when the debt keeps increasing, you have to uh, stop. You have to take measures to stop it. It's uh, it's that it's that simple. Uh, but politically, it's not that simple. Uh, Padman Desai, please. I should mention also again that we are on the record for this presentation with Vice Chairman Fisher and members. Uh, let's try to keep the observations and questions down to a contained amount to get as many people as we can. Please. Thank you. Uh, in view of the contentious politics in Congress, over fiscal policy and the budgetary management, uh, do you think uh, that the entire burden of managing the economy during the recession phase has fallen on monetary policy and the Federal Reserve? Would you like to comment on that? Because fiscal policy was all uh, non-functioning almost, changing. changing. <laughs> The fiscal policy makers don't meet every six weeks to decide uh, what step they want to undertake next. They sort of watch the situation. When things get too far from control, they, uh, they make changes. We've had changes. We had a very expansionary fiscal policy, 2009, 2010. Uh, there was, uh, I used to say, we have, uh, the United States has had looking at the data, a very uh, responsible fiscal policy. Listening to the noise, you wouldn't know that. You have to actually look at the data. Um, but uh, we sort of day to day, or sorry, month to month, it was the Fed that was making the decisions. In the background with big fiscal policy decisions which affected what was going on. Within those fiscal policy, in, in, in conversation I have with everyone, there's this frustration over infrastructure. I don't know if you dealt with that as governor of the Bank of Israel or with your work over the years, but there's this fiscal yearning that will do something about our infrastructure. Is there a Fisher plan, like the Marshall plan? <laughs> Mar Marshall came along with some money. Yeah, uh, well. That, uh, <laughs> For that particular, uh, that particular plan. Look, a lot of economists, uh, and here I'm definitely speaking not for the committee but for myself, as I have been all along, uh, a lot of economists believe that a responsibly financed infrastructure-based uh, change in fiscal policy would both uh, assist, uh, assist uh, the increase in productivity growth that we're all hoping to see and uh, contribute to uh, fiscal, uh, to strengthening the economy. Um, sir, right here. Sir, numbers of politicians, his name is Steve Schwebel. Numbers of- Steve, could we have the, the, the microphone, please? Numbers of politicians have criticized not only certain activities of the Federal Reserve, but some even its very existence. Could you comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing that in Iowa today. <laughs> I, uh, I had the privilege of watching this uh, global crisis, the one that started in 2008, uh, unfold from a long distance. Uh, and uh, I thought the Fed did a terrific job. I think the country owes a lot to the Fed. I had nothing to do with it, so I can say that. Uh, and uh, saved, I believe, the statement that the Fed saved the United States from a renewed Great Depression. And that's not a small thing. So that's how I see the situation. Now, there are others who believe either that there were better monetary policies which should have been followed, and probably there were, but possibly not in the direction that many of the critics uh, have said, and, or that uh, we should go to some other mechanism. 
Well, we've tried a lot of those mechanisms. We used to have a gold standard. It didn't work. Then we decided that the money supply was everything. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so it goes. And uh, I believe that what the Fed is doing is fundamentally uh, correct. And the way it's set up, it's an immensely complicated organization. It's quasi, it's half government and half private. Uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve Bank, the, the regional Federal Reserves, are actually in form private. They're not in practice private, but that's, that's the setup. But clearly that's how it was set up in 1913. It survived 100 years, which is much longer than either of the first two central banks which the United States set up in the, in the 19th century uh, did. So one listens to the critics. I always believe you have to listen to your critics. Frequently they have a point. In this case, I don't see a major point about uh, the way the Fed is doing things and why it might be doing it in the wrong direction. I don't think that's the case. How do you respond then to the critics, Vice Chairman Fisher, who simplistically say this is a, this is a Fed wedded to the Phillips curve within a broad sense of traditional economic modeling and that they either have to have a new attitude or no attitude as it is? How do you respond to that simplistic criticism? Well, the, uh, you know, the Phillips curve, the, the wage to inflation route has never been that tight. It's around. And uh, this is based on something very simple, which is that the uh, tighter the labor market becomes, the more likely it is the wages are going to rise. That doesn't seem to me to be a very sophisticated theory which is beyond the capacity of human beings to understand because it's too mathematical and it's tied up in some complex model. I think it's correct, uh, but it doesn't mean that the linkage is immediate uh, or necessarily rapid. Do you have any worries of wage inflation at this time? I mean, I it's been out there for a year and a half. I keep waiting. Yes. Uh, we. Uh, we are hoping that we will see signs of wage inflation. Uh, it was 2.5% last year, and uh, at least one of the measures was 2.5%. 3%, mm -hmm. I think, is roughly where people would, uh, would like to be. Mm. Sir. Th thank you very much. Uh, you, you talked about volatility uh, that uh, is uh, current and uh, that is uh, still uh, going to be probably with us for the rest of the year. How do you view the Chinese uh, policy volatility uh, in attempts to intervene in markets that uh, are politically driven that their technocrats know are not viable? Well, uh, that, that takes me to a whole host of questions. I'll have to ask you to figure out uh, the answer to that. I think the uh, focus has been on the uh, Chinese exchange rate uh, mechanism more than any, more than any other. And um, the uh, capacity to change exchange rate regimes, if that's Years ago, Lou Alexander had a wonderful paper on the use of our computers, our technology, and the way it cuts two ways in society. Lou, a question for the vice chairman, please. Just, I believe what Tom's referring to was at some point I talked about the sort of the linkage between technology. It's really scope bias, technical change, the issues of how that relates to um, income inequality. I guess I'd like to turn that to potential output. In some ways, I would agree. I, I, I think you'd probably agree that there's generally a consensus that potential growth, not only in the U.S. but around the world, is slowed. We've obviously seen these trends in widening income gaps. There's a broad understanding that the complementarity between skill and technology is widening the income gap. I wonder if you'd speculate on how much of the slowdown in productivity growth that we see in potential growth is also related to that and is, could be thought of as more as a sort of a broader skill problem. It's, a, it's an issue in terms of how we face that going forward. 
we hear a lot about shortages of uh, skilled labor. People come by from industry, from uh, construction sectors and so forth, and come and speak to the Fed. And uh, we hear all the time we can't find uh, skilled, skilled workers. So I suspect there are some shortages of uh, skilled workers. Uh, there's a question of uh, frequently uh, whether they're re receiving pay that would encourage them to continue investing in their skills. Uh, and uh, beyond that, I, I don't have uh, very, very clear uh, insights. We have these amazing new technologies, uh, namely IT and uh, the internet and uh, all the uh, related, related uh, services that we have. I once said to somebody, uh, you know, we say that all the time, but actually we're precisely the people those inventions are aimed at, and so we think there's tremendous technical progress because it's the sort of thing we, we need and we use. And uh, the answer I got made me think. They said, have you ever been on the subway? I said, yes. I said, what do, you think, what do you think people are all doing on the subway? Well, I knew they're all reading their iPhones or whatever it is they're doing. They're, whoever they are on the subway, they're all in that revolution as well. So I haven't studied subways in other cities and I don't know enough about it and all that. But I have a feeling that we're coming out of a period of a massive crisis, coming out of it relatively well. Uh, we've almost forgotten what a serious crisis it was. Uh, and I'm sometimes amazed when people say the economy's done nothing. You say, yeah, well, what odds would you have given on the economy being at full employment in 2015? Right. Uh, when the crisis uh, started. So I think we've got to wait and see how this works out. But the heart of this matter, to lose good question, is if, if we have a part of America that is taking advantage of the technological progress, the challenge of your Fed is you have to manage for that America and another America that's being left behind. Are you managing for two Americas? Are you managing monetary policy for two Americas? I think the, we're managing for two Americas in the sense that we're managing to the average unemployment rate. And uh, we look at other aspects of it, uh, people who are part-time unemployed, et cetera. Um, so we have one tool. There are a lot of things that monetary policy can't do. Mm -hmm. There are things the educational system should do. There is not a lot of chance that monetary policy will solve the inequality problem or will solve uh, the gaps between, uh, product, uh, between uh, productivity enhancing uh, technologies that are good for some people and not for others. Those have to do with actions the uh, federal government and uh, state and local governments should be uh, undertaking. Part of the Council on Foreign Relations that's so good is they establish a debate. Let me turn to Mickey Levy of Berenberg Bank or the question, Mickey, you've been a a constructive critic of, of much of what we've done in monetary policy. A question for the vice chairman, please. Tom. Yes, you've, you've been a champion of inflation targeting, and you and all the Fed members have argued that 2% um, inflation is your long run goal. And you noted today that inflation, core inflation 1.4 is below that. Um, Presumably, and I've heard many Fed members say it, along with ECB members say, that um, you want to avoid any whiff of deflation because expectations of deflation could lead people to save rather than spend. And we've heard recent Fed members over the last couple of years say, inflation's too low, it's harmful. So I have a question. Do you see any signs anywhere that inflation is so low it is leading people to uh, save rather than spend and or do you see any signs anywhere that in low inflation is harming the economy well Mickey there's a uh, concern about uh, too low interest rates in the sense of what happens if you get a negative shock you know 
going back to uh, the zero lower bound, uh, is, is a major concern. Uh, and there is the, the discussion on what is the optimal rate of uh, We haven't uh, got any precise evidence of that being related to what's happening to productivity growth, but uh, that's, uh, that's a possibility. Um, Sir? This lady in red to mm -hmm. my back line, so. Hi. Another question on China, if I may. Um, the IMF said that there was a problem of communication with their, uh, you know, with what they did with the exchange rate. Um, so I was just wondering, do you, do you talk to them? Uh, do you do you plan a trip to China soon, or do you do you even have their phone number on your mobile phone? Um, I uh, the the governors of the world of the leading economies meet every two months uh, in Basel at the Bank for International Settlements and discuss to mm -hmm. anybody uh, in that community you, well, and have a, a serious conversation. In World War II, I believe the Eccles uh, building, the, the main room was the war room for the generals. Do you have a currency war room at the Fed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't felt the need right, uh, yet. And uh, we'll see. But it is nice to sit in this very elegant room with yeah. a statement with uh, plaques on the wall that this is where this operation was planned, speak, that operation was planned. Speak to the global audience It's asking about dollar strength, about the worry of too strong of a dollar even as other currencies depreciate. Take us back to Fisher Academics 101. Should we fear a stronger dollar? Well, at some point, uh, currencies can become uh, very, uh, very strong. Um, the, there's an agreement among the, the uh, con among countries. It is an inevitable result of an easy monetary policy that your currency weakens. The agreement is the international community of policymakers frowns upon measures which are undertaken purely to influence the exchange rate. It understands that if you undertake an expansionary monetary policy, cut interest rates, that you're going to get a weakening of your currency. If the conclusion is that you're engaged in an attempt to strengthen your economy and there's a side result of that on the exchange rate, that's okay. If you're engaged purely in using the exchange rate to uh, gain an advantage on other countries, that's not okay. Ma'am? to the numbers that you put out that talk about the numbers or percentages of workers who are getting um, enough money to right. take care of their families and, for example, don't have to depend on food stamps. Well, it, it, but this goes to the heart of, America, of John Edwards of two Americas. Is, is the Fed mechanism changed given an anger that's out there as we see in our political debate? Is the process that you're working with changed? process hasn't uh, changed. We're using the same set of monetary tools. It's slightly different because we have this gigantic uh, portfolio at the moment uh, to work on the aggregates. We don't have the capacity to mm -hmm. ensure that the minimum wage is both uh, wise in the sense that it's not creating unemployment and uh, fair. We'd, like, we'd be very happy if there were such a, a mechanism, and that's not things that the... I don't see a new calculus to address the polarity of the labor force. I can see research which is taking place and which has mm. led to many discussions of the relationship between the things we do and uh, the distribution of, of income, uh, uh, namely or low interest rates, good for the poor or bad for the poor. Uh, the uh, people who look at them say, well, uh, they must be uh, bad for the poor because it's the rich who, say, who invest uh, and so forth. That uh, actually doesn't make sense. What is good for the poor is employment. And that is a goal of ours. And that is a goal that we succeeded in uh, dealing with very strongly, or the American economy succeeded in dealing with it very strongly. And we have close to uh, full employment at the moment. 
It may, may be a bit lower than the current rate, maybe about the current rate. Mm -hmm. We're in that vicinity. And that is the achievement of uh, the monetary policy that has been followed. We succeeded in getting through the hour without speaking of the next meeting. Could we go out two meetings? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.